And Acton also, I think our underlying philosophy is definitely very libertarian. So, um, so I would also think that families that are moving here because of the Bitcoin um, concentration would be aligned with us. Like I was talking about the filter, making sure families yeah. want us, not just like, oh, there's a school nearby. But like, oh, there's an Acton Academy nearby? Heck yeah, we're moving to El Salvador. You know, that's the kind of energy that we want. So Bitcoin, beer, and education is what we're going to talk about. <laughs> no, not necessarily in that order, but uh, yeah, we'll be delving into a little bit of the history of how the Acton Academy got started here in El Salvador. And first of all, how did you wind up here? Uh, I don't think, I think you're about as uh, local to here as, as I am. So love to hear a little bit of your history of what brought you to, to be living here. Sure, sure. Well, like a lot of expats here, love brought me here. I met my husband, David, who uh, is from El Salvador, but had gone to university in the States, had stayed there for 17 years. Um, we met in New York City when we were both already working in our careers, fell in love and decided that we should be near family uh, instead of in New York City where we didn't have family. So it was like St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from, or the exotic El Salvador on the Pacific Ocean, where I could learn Spanish and live a tropical paradise life. Um, so had, had you visited before you decided to move, or was I it? did? Okay, and they took me to all the most beautiful yes, places: yes. Lago Cuatepeque, Maculis, like everything beautiful, Suchitoto. Um, and I loved it. I loved it, and I always loved traveling and. I had lived in Europe and different regions in the United States. So for me, this was just like another adventure. So we decided to come for two years and we've been here for 15. So <laughs> isn't that kind of how it works here? Yeah, I think that was uh, originally I got my wife to commit to two years and uh, yeah, we never left. <laughs> was that, so was that 2012? When, Eight. When, 2008. Eight, 2008. Okay. 2008, yeah. So that was right, if I remember right, 2008, things were, had been starting to improve and then the financial crisis mm -hmm. hit mm -hmm. and yes, things kind of went backwards. And so it was still going back and forth between being the, the country with the highest murder rate in the world. Was that daunting for you at all? Or was that just not something that, you know, was on your radar or? For your family back home or what was the what were your you thoughts know, on that? I joke that like I didn't even Google it. I just came and we it was like we would just do this fun thing. I was very adventuresome and that I just thought I would do this fun thing for a couple of years. And I did I guess I didn't realize how dangerous the country was until I really was living here. And then I could feel that ambient sense of like insecurity that people had. Um, so that was a little bit scary. I think my family was worried about us, but they kept it real, you know, subtle and quiet. And they did come and visit. My parents are very, you know, intrepid travelers too. So they would come and visit. Um, and you know, you did all the things like you live in a safe neighborhood and you have security or, or whatever. So you kind of travel between the bubbles here, you know, which now feels a lot better. Yeah. Did you, did you ever feel like in danger yourself or did you like, I'll tell people that I, I never felt in danger. I felt like as a foreigner, I was kind of off limits, like, but I could go places that the locals here told me they couldn't go. And I went, and I don't know if you felt that at all or. Well, I think I was a mom, I was, I was pregnant when I got here and then I was a mom. So I, I think you're wired a little bit during those yeah, times yeah, yeah. to be very, be you know, bear. yeah. So I think um, I did feel some of that. Nothing bad has ever happened to me here. Thank God. Um, and really, I don't know many people who bad things have happened to directly. Um, but you do feel that like we're no, it's not okay to walk in the street yeah. like it is in New York City or you know, or anywhere else, you know. So it was that kind of thing that did feel where you People, I think a friend of mine used to say, it's the city of walls. It's the city of walls. Paris is the city of light, and this is the city of walls.
walls. So it does, it feels good. My, my husband would tell me about times when he grew up here and there were no walls before they put them up. To imagine that was, was wonderful. And now um, it do, certainly does feel safer now, which is a blessing. That was one of the things that was surprising to me. Like you said, everything has walls. The walls go out to the front of the street mm -hmm. and even the find businesses. A lot of times they wouldn't have signs up at that time because if people knew you were there, they would extort you. And so right. it was tough even finding like, wait, mm -hmm. this feels like I'm going to somebody's house, but it was a business. And yeah, yeah, it was very locals only. Like you had to know the city. You had to know people. You had to know like where things were. And I felt, you know, that's why I started, if I can just jump into expats yeah. in El Salvador, was that I noticed like my husband and his family knew all of these things about the culture and the way things worked that I didn't know when I got here, obviously, but that I learned from them. And then I had other friends who came here to work either for the embassy or for a multinational, and they didn't have that same access and those same connections that I had through my husband's whole friend group and all of his family. And so I started the Expats Facebook group to get to help foreigners have that access and that community and that connection that they didn't otherwise have. Um, and over time, it's just grown. I think we're close to 10,000 people now. And uh, and I think it's done a lot of good for, for people who move here and help them find what they're looking for and to feel comfortable and like they have a sense of belonging here. What, what percentage of the people in that group do you think are actually living here? You know, I don't know. I have about 2,600 2, people are actively uh, are active on the page a week. Okay. So I'm thinking it might be around that many. Um, I've we've done some we've done some calling. I was a little more free with who could join before, but lately it's it started to grow where it was like a lot of people who I felt weren't expats and were kind of using the group where I wanted it to be a balance of giving and getting. And so we did kind of call a little bit and take out some people who I didn't feel were really truly expats or really truly offering anything. So I think that did up our percentage of people who actually live here. Yeah. So it's, it's always a tough balance because you, you know, if you let it be a free for all, then people will just leave because it just becomes you're getting spammed and people are trying to sell you stuff nonstop. Exactly. But there are some times that you need to buy stuff or you want. So it's finding that like, yeah. hey, this isn't just a swap meet page, but sometimes it's okay to like, yeah. So I'm, I'm exactly. sure for you guys as moderators, <laughs> it's like, where do we draw the line? We've had to like swing between yeah. being more rigid and more, more flexible over time. So it is. It's, and we don't, I mean, we don't always get it perfectly right. So, you know, I get rage filled um, messages on Facebook Messenger from people sometimes and I just ignore it. Yeah. No, there's some unhappy people in that group. Yes. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> My wife can't go on every. I, I have thick skin, so <laughs> I'll post something. It's not. I'm, I'm not. It's not negative or anything. And they'll like just lay I into cry. me. And my wife's like, it's all upset. I'm like, yeah, they're just having a bad day. Like this is the way they let off steam. But, but it 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 has been interesting. There's a weird dynamic in the group towards Bitcoin. Like anything Bitcoin related, you put on. There's a lot of people that are very negative, but there's also a lot of new people, part of that, that are here because of Bitcoin. And yes. so it's, you know, and I want to explain that because when Bitcoin kind of burst onto the scene here, suddenly we were flooded with people that were spamming. Yeah. Call me. I can help you. You can win. You know, you can earn millions of dollars overnight, blah, blah, blah. And so we had to really dial that down yeah. and say no Bitcoin spam and no promotion. Which 100%. But, but we didn't with. mean like, don't talk about yeah. it. We just were trying to get rid of those people that were trying to like take advantage of people. So um, so I want to say officially, like, yes, of course, like we would love to have more information about Bitcoin and be part of all that's going on. Um, but just know none of that spam. Yeah. You know, no, no, I haven't you. gotten that from, from you at all. But there okay. are some people on the page that get very... Yeah, it, it's like triggering for them for some for some reason. Yeah. And I don't know if it's because they connect it with political things or what it is, but it it yeah. becomes you know sometimes I'll post something just informative and then it becomes this like I wasn't trying to stir the pot, but right. uh, yeah, sometimes it. <laughs> but it is interesting too. You see, even within the page, there's there's a lot of new expats that 
have moved in mm -hmm. because of the Bitcoin law and are connected to that. So it'll be interesting to see how that kind of changes it. But, but I really want to focus on the education thing. We'll, sure. we'll come back to, to that. Uh, you founded a school here in, was it 12 or was it? 2016. 2016, mm -hmm. okay. So tell us about the Acton Academy, why, I mean, I'm sure when you, well, actually let's go back further. Okay. When you came to El Salvador, what were you guys doing? And then let's let's see how you wound up being, uh, you know, brewing beer and uh, <laughs> running a school and right. maybe not combining the two. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. So, um, sure. So, my husband and a partner had started a business in New York, in New York, in Westchester, that was um, a financial research um, sales firm. So they were selling financial research for some of the big like financial research people kind of as an outsourced sales department. And this is like a, for brokerages and banks for or like, you know, like Morningstar. Yeah. So for a big competitor of Morningstar. Okay. So um, it was a great business for a long time. Um, but oh, so we moved here in 2008 in July. We moved into our house in September. I was due to have my baby in November. And in October of 2008, when the whole economic collapse was happening, um, that was a very scary time for us. It was just a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty. And because the business was about financial research, we were terrified that people were going to leave the market and not be researching stocks and things. Well, that's exactly what happened. So um, my husband had come down and, and set up a call center. This is a great place to have a call center. It was a boutique. His brother worked for him as kind of the sales manager, and and it was, um, it, you know, we were really excited about it. And then and they this were happened. they were calling people to like sell the research services that that he was doing. Yeah, it was inbound and outbound, okay. I believe. So um, and it did very well. But then once everyone started kind of like getting out of the market between 08 and ten, the business really was just losing revenue, right? And so in the meantime, we had moved here and we had, we love great beer. Like we had lived in New York City. I'm from St. Louis. Like we loved craft beer. And so we started, because at the time there were only Constancia products here and a couple of imports, we were disappointed and we wanted better beer. So my husband as a hobby started brewing beer in our home. And we'd make like 50 beers at a time, have our friends over and they'd be gone, you know, and then you have to wait another month, you'd have to brew and like wait another month for fermentation and everything. Um, and so as soon as like, I mean, it was a really scary time. By the time we, we kind of decided that business wasn't going to work anymore, I had a baby and a toddler who was two years old and a newborn. And we just were like, what are we going to do? Um, and I just looked at my husband this day and said, listen, when Vikings would leave and go to a new island, they would burn the boat. We, we can't go back. We're going to burn the boat and we're going to open a bottle of champagne and we're going to cheers because we're doing we're going to do something amazing. There's going to be a new adventure. And then he decided to do a microbrewery. So he found some investing partners and um, and that was it. He started building it. And through the process, he learned how to brew beer, how to set up a brew house, how to create a restaurant, everything that you need to know. It's an extremely complex process. Well, and I'm sure just getting the ingredients and the equipment that you needed was quite the process. There was no other breweries, like no other microbreweries existed here. So right. I'm sure that that was tough. It was tough. And he... He's really great at, at finding great deals. And so he ended up buying the brew house from China, which at the time was kind of like people were really afraid to buy things from China. But it ended up being like the best customer service, the best quality. It was incredible. So um, so he also learned a skill of being able to do that, which later allowed him to help other brewers in the world to buy from China. Um, and uh, so... It was amazing because he David went through a, an autodidactic process. So he learned how to do all of that on his own by reading, talking to people, and joining groups on the internet, like Pro Brewer. So that was a real inspirational time for us to, to where we really understood like 
school, the school learning isn't what allowed him to do that. It was learning on his own and being able to like learning how to learn was how he was able to do yeah. that process. Then during that time, because I had to kind of help keep body and soul together while he was building Carejo, I started um, doing coaching and then also doing SAT prep and college coaching. So I had to really quickly become an entrepreneur and learn how to sell and learn how to set up a business and learn how to create a proposition and like get, you know, take a skill that I had and just develop it and start selling. And so um, through that process as well, we both sort of became entrepreneurs and became autodidacts. And so um, Cadejo finally opened and then- And you opened with- was the first location a restaurant also, or what, did you open just the brewery part first? Just the brewery with a little, and then we were with um, Go Green, the uh -huh. greenhouse. They rented a little space outside of the brewery, and they sold food, and we sold beer. Okay. But then really quickly, we saw that the food was a great idea, and they hadn't wanted to sign a long lease with us. So we were like, okay, lease is up. We're going to make our own restaurant. So then my husband made a, a restaurant there and then that just kept growing. Then I think four years later, we opened in Santa Tecla, Santa Rosa, and then we just kept growing from there. So was we the had, first one in San Benito? Was that the, the first, first one? one? Yeah, in okay. Sonorosa. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it's still there. It's still there with the factory and you can go on tours. And, okay, I didn't yeah, know you yeah. guys had tours. So yeah, we do. Uh, and I brought those up. you. Some beer. All to right. Share with you guys. <laughs> Perfect. So fresh craft beer which, from Cadejo. Which, which one is this? Yeah, that's our. So we come out with temper, like what do you call them? Temporada. Uh -huh. Seasonal. Seasonals. So that's a pumpkin spice. Okay. And then we have our Oktoberfest, which is absolutely incredible. I think it's won some awards recently. And then the Swagada IPA. So I don't know what you like, but I got nice. you two. We, we, each, we've so. got the the combo pack. Perfect. Well, I remember that time you couldn't get, I mean, other than the, the, what's, I'm blanking now on the, what's the, Constancia. Constancia, yeah. Yeah, the, the beers that they have. I mean, I, I remember seeing, it was, they had like Paps Blue Ribbon in the store one time for like $3 a can. <laughs> and it was like, and I just thought it was so funny because at yeah. that time, you know, Paps Blue Ribbon was like 50 cents in the US. I'm like, can you imagine paying $3 for a Paps Blue Ribbon? But there was, for anybody to get anything other than that was a big deal. So I remember yes. when when you guys launched, it really made waves because yeah. there'd never been anything like that here. So. Yeah, 110 years. There had never been another brewery. But, that, but you know, a significant brewery. There yeah. was a, there was that, that couple, Andy and... And Nanal, who's yeah, you know, yeah, I know they had a little something had in Altunco. a little one in Altunco. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they were friends. That was that was fun times. So, from the beginning, could you guys tell that this was going to be successful, or were there like days where you're like, "What in the world did we do? This we're crazy," or how did that? Because it seemed like it was met pretty well. Like it seemed like people embraced it from the get go. But I don't know what it was like on your guys' side. Yeah, it was definitely. One of those things where it's just like we we can't fail. Like this is this is what we're doing. This is what we have. We have our family. We're here. We burned the boat. Like we're not going to fail. Um, pandemic was certainly really difficult when restaurants closed and schools closed. Um, but yeah, we did. We in the beginning, yes, it, it was met with a lot of um, excitement. I think they've done a great job of building the brand. I think a lot of people know what Cadejo is when you say it, um, and that's great. Um, and Cadejo is it's like a a dog, right? It was like a traditional dog yeah. or I'm probably butchering the story. You, well, you so uh, yeah, it's a local legend throughout all of the region except maybe Belize, I'm not sure. Um and it's a it's like the you know the street dogs, right? Like yeah. Cateros in the night. So it it this, as I I've heard many versions, but the version that we started with them was that like there is a white Cadejo who is like benevolent and will protect drunks as they're walking home. And then there's a dark Cadejo with red eyes that will persecute evil people at, at, you know, at night. And so you gotta be careful. Like if you're a good person, it will help you. But if you're not, you better watch out. Um, I also heard that that legend protects animals because if people are afraid it will turn into a beast that will hurt you, they won't throw rocks at dogs. <laughs> so we liked that. And then as my, as my mother says, Oh, yeah, that legend. It's like, you know how some people, when they get drunk, they're mean and some people are nice. That's what it means. 
<laughs> so that's my mother's interpretation of it. <laughs> well, it's it. I mean, it has a good sound to it. I Doesn't mean, it? It sounds like familiar, even if you never heard it. So, right. So. Yeah. That's our partner Mariano came up with that, and it was a brilliant okay. decision. So I think you told me that you guys have four, almost 12, 14, 12, 12, 12 I think it's locations. 12. Yes. We have the airport, Santa Rosa, which is in Santa Tecla, uh -huh. two in Guatemala, one here in Sensal. Are the ones in Guatemala beach. and Guatemala City or where? One's in Guatemala City and one is on the way to Antigua okay. in a in a central commercial called Majadas. And then we have two in the airport here. Um, like one in the old side and one in the new side? Or? No. One in the old side, and then one in this new area, another area that's open. Okay. I'm not really sure. Um, my husband would have to answer that one. And then we're in Plaza Venecia. I think we have one in Soyapango. We have one in Opico. So we're we're yeah we're we're moving far. One in San Miguel. So we really are like moving throughout the country. I didn't realize you guys had one in San Miguel. Mm -hmm. So we do. Anything in between there? Anything in the Sulatan? Mm -hmm. No. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> Where is the one in San Miguel? Is it downtown or is it? Honestly, I have not been there, okay. so I'm not sure. So oh, and then we have Montaña. You have so many places you haven't been there. I haven't and... been there to San Miguel. but And we have Carejo Montaña, which is beautiful. And that's the event center, right? That's the yeah. one like up on up in Huizucar, which is like 20, 200, 270 degrees of the city. And it's absolutely beautiful, magical. So for people who came last year to Adopting Bitcoin and went to the speaker's party, that's where they had that yeah, there, I believe. Yeah, yes. So yeah, it was, I'd never been there before. I was, we were driving there, I was like, where are we going? And then you get there, you're <laughs> like, oh, okay, now I, now I see why. It was worth the drive. Thank so you. it's beautiful up there. Thank you, yeah. So you guys have built that up fast. I mean, that's. It's been 10 and a half years. It'll be 11 years in okay. February. So you're just like an you know, average of one one new location a year, a little bit better than that. Yeah. So, and then you sell at all the supermarkets. Um, do you guys sell much outside of El Salvador or? We were selling in um, Washington, D.C. There was a very like chispa um, hermano lejano there. Yeah. And he asked to distribute the beer there. Um, but during the pandemic, it kind of fell fell off. So. We're still definitely interested um, in the nostalgia. That's what they call it, the nostalgia market yeah. in the United States, where there are concentrations of Salvadorans. Yeah, I could see in D.C., L.A. Yeah, exactly, Texas. Being, yeah. Even a little sense. bit in New York. So, yeah, we would love to do that. But it's a, you know, that's a whole nother like business to do exporting like that. So, yeah, so, yeah we're open to it. Anyone one, who wants one, to help with that. One of my sister's friend's dad did stuff with... Uh, Shoot, what's the name of the, I want to say Maria, but it's not Maria. What's the name of all the snacks they have? Diana. Oh, Diana, uh-huh. That, that, that was his whole job was like the market in the U.S. because there's all these, uh, I mean, I think the snacks are horrible, but right. <laughs> he said that that like for the people, you know, they're, they have the nostalgia for home. For, so for them mm -hmm. to be able to buy them in the U.S., it was, so that was like his home market. They sell quite a bit there. I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that makes I'm sense. I'm sure they that, do. Like yeah. the pollo campero yeah. that everyone yeah. takes home. <laughs> <laughs> we always we always joke with people to make sure they. We had some friends that left the other day, and they're taking pictures of all the pollo campero that they saw on the, uh, on the plane. Yeah. So one one time we were coming down, and it was a joke. I brought Kentucky Fried Chicken down, <laughs> coming this way, and I told them I. You really I, did. Yeah, yeah. It's just. <laughs> Just it was at the airport and I was hungry. So I was like, I'm going to bring Kentucky Fried Chicken down. I'll tell them I'm bringing the American chicken down to El Salvador. Uh, even though I, Pollo Comparo, I think is much better. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. But it's, it's, delicious. it's funny that they haul it home because there are Pollo Comparos in the U.S. In some places. And, but yeah. even in the place, because I've mean, seen them on places. The and then that's what they always say. They're it's like, not the same. it's not the same. I'm like... <laughs> Even after you've hauled it, like, it's like it's 10 hours old, <laughs> cramped on the plane, and you still think it's better than the fresh stuff you got there. Yeah, it's that nostalgia. Yeah. It's uh, one time we were on a plane, and somehow somebody had brought a 
ice cooler on. I don't know how they let them bring it on, but, and it had ice in it. And then it melted during the thing and they had it turned sideways in the overhead. Oh no. And so you had water sloshing up and down and then there was a bunch of people with chicken there. So it was like <laughs> mixing with it. And halfway through the flight, like there's all this water starts dripping down like on everybody. And the flight no. attendants were like freaking out. <laughs> we were just cracking up. We were like, ah. Oh. It's, it's, never, it's never dull on uh, never. Uh, a flight to El Salvador. <laughs> So uh, that between that and the you know thirty wheelchairs that are lined up on either side, right. it's like they hold the record for the ni- most number of people in wheelchairs. Yes, I know. I call the wheelchair brigade. <laughs> the crazy thing is, I've had some of those ladies that get in those wheelchairs like knock my kids over as they're trying to get off the. Pl- I mean, I'm like, you don't look like you needed that wheelchair right. there. You look pretty able bodied. <laughs> That's funny. Um. I got off. I got off. I got off topic here. No, what, that's what, all right. what, what were we talking about? Beer. What were we talking? We were going to talk ah, about Acton. Acton. And so, we, but we wanted to cover cut. So it yeah. So so you guys were in the the beer business, and yeah. this thing blew up. I I'm assuming it's done way beyond what you guys were expecting, or did you have grand plans I'm not from the sure beginning? What the expectation was. Um, I mean, did you think that the country could support 12 locations? No, I think uh, no, definitely yeah, not. And I, I think in the beginning, we thought it would be more like distributing beer and that we wouldn't actually have a restaurant company. Uh-huh. And right now it really is more of a restaurant company with beer. Yeah. So um, so, I, so that that changed, which was a new thing. You know, we, we never ran restaurants before. So, so that was another learning curve to go up. And it's definitely... Uh, staffing challenge a lot of people and it's very transitory and a lot of training it's a it's a tough it's a tough gig the yeah. the restaurant business how has it been finding employees recently has it gotten tougher or is it just kind of a consistent or what have you found yeah i think um judging from what my husband says when he comes home from work like yeah i think it is it's always been difficult i'm not sure and yes, I think recently it has been more difficult. I'm well, not it seems sure like why. there's a lot of so every, many everybody's working. Right. It seemed, I mean, we've seen that here in El Zante. It used to be everybody was like coming to you and you felt like, oh, we don't need anybody else, but there's no work out mm-hmm. there. So maybe we'll try to give them a day. Now everybody's complaining that yeah, they can't find employees right, because right. everybody's working. So I, I didn't know if that's just here or if you guys have experienced that. No, yeah, I think we're too. experiencing that as well. Yeah, it's hard to find people. Yeah. And then did you guys get hit much with like inflation issues with restaurant supplies during COVID? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And with shipping because we import all the grains and we import, we import the hops. So that's been, that was really difficult. Um, those, when the shipping containers went, you know, skyrocketed in terms of price, that was hard. Oh, yeah. They went from like $4,000 to $20,000. Right. Like, yes. Was- so that was really difficult. And then it's been difficult. Um, there were some supply chain issues of getting, just even getting grains and things from Europe has been hard. Um, and our because of Ukraine and stuff yeah. like that. So, so yeah, there's always, you know, being an entrepreneur is just like playing tennis with problems. Like another problem goes, you just have to deal with it. So, yeah. I think in two, because we had, I was telling you before, we had a food service business in the U.S. Uh, and <clears throat> it was 21. I remember getting... We sell like a ton of turkey legs is one of our big things that we'd sell, barbecued turkey legs. And um, we, we got an order in and it's like s- multiple pallets. It's like half a truckload. And the price had gone up 40%. And Whoa. I was like, and my rep was like, hey, you're lucky I even got those for you. Like, if you don't want them, trust me, I got. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was it was a tough time because everything, you know, and you're like, well, I can't read do my prices every day, but mm-hmm, prices mm-hmm. were coming in hot. Yeah. So that's tough. Do you sell turkey legs to like Renaissance festivals? So we do like big fairs and, uh-huh. and festivals. So not the Renaissance festivals, but we have a big barbecue. We have one thing where everything's wrapped in bacon. So that's, <laughs> it's called Bacon Affair. Real original. But so we do like a two pound uh, turkey leg wrapped in a pound of bacon. Oh, wow. So it's just, it's just like ginormous. Uh, yeah. At one time, we don't do it anymore because it was so much work, but 
we sold, uh, we call them unicorn legs, but they're actually pig legs, like the front <laughs> shank of a pig. It was five pounds. And so we smoked them for like 10 hours, and it was, but it was a lot of work. So Wow. Yeah. So I know the food business. I know it's not easy Where do you eat barbecue money. here? Uh, I actually like, uh, oh, I'm blanking now on the the name. Uh, Umo? Yeah. Um. Umo. I mean, it's it's, I wouldn't say it's like amazing, but. It's amazing to be able to get it here because right. you couldn't get any barbecue here for a long time. Right, right. So I don't know. Is there any better places that have come out recently? And not that. No, I mean, I don't know. Not that I know of. But um, we, we do tons of grilling at, at Montana, but yeah. I don't know if I would call it barbecue. Yeah. What makes it barbecue? Barbecue is is Sauce? basically it's no it's 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 in, usually enclosed and for like long periods of time. Oh, so like grilling, smoked. yeah. So grilling, you're you're really like directly exposing it to the heat, and mm. it's you know usually less than a half an hour. Barbecue is usually like multiple hours on oh, okay. what they call it. Uh, was it slow and low? You have it uh -huh. on low heat and just like cooks really slow. So yeah, it's a it's a different. I mean, sometimes people call barbecue grill, they mix them up, but real barbecue people will bite your head off if you do that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. We should have a barbecue fest down here. I know. Right? Like, we need more things I, like that. I, I, festivals, I think that festivals. that sounds like Cadejo right. can, can, uh, <laughs> can sponsor that. So uh, let's put it together. All right. <laughs> no, I think there's... Um, well, and I think people are in the mood for it. Like, people are wanting to be out and about now. Yes. As, as things have gotten safer, it's just really changed the character, especially at night events. It used to be nobody would do anything at night. Right. Now, now you go places at night, they're, they put that pump track on uh, for skateboarding at the bottom of the um, where the bypass is. And, oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's all lit. I went by the other night at like 9.30 at night and there's all these kids out there Fantastic. playing on it. Yeah, I was like, that just warms Super. my heart. Yeah, definitely. So, So you guys started this business like, Right after the financial crisis, gangs were controlling everything here. El Salvador had the worst reputation in the world. Horrible, yeah. And still you were able to be successful with this beer business. I'm sure everybody thought you were crazy starting it. <laughs> I guess. They didn't say that. <laughs> but maybe they thought it. Yeah. And then you went on to start a school. So tell us about the school, why you jumped from brewing to, to educating. Yeah. So... um. I just, I've always loved education. I was a constructive science teacher in New York. Um, my husband loves to learn and we what, love- what, what grade did you teach in New York? I taught middle school. Okay. My middle wife, I only asked because my wife was a middle school science teacher. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. I want to meet her. So, so um, love learning, love school, love all the things. But then um, <clears throat> when, so I, I had this very like romantic idea of the way that education should be. And it was very- hands-on, very exploratory. I was a Montessori kid. Um, and I just had a way that I really wanted my children to learn. And that's how we were with our children in the early days, right? When they were little. So we were very attachment parents. We um, wanted them to be independent and autonomous. We wanted them to be um, exploring all the time. My son loved to make like any vehicle possible. He loved to build, even when he was like very, very young, it was amazing the things that he would take and try to build cars. And um, and my daughter and he would build marble runs and all these kind of things. And then when I put them in school, um, it's actually in the, in the school of Americana. And that's where my, my husband had gone. He had a great experience. His friends were very good people who did very well in life. He went to Cornell from the school of Americana. So I was like, all right, this is probably a decent school. I didn't really look around at schools. I just thought this is where we'll go because this is where his, their yeah. father went, right? So we went, and as far as, you know, a conventional school goes, I think it was probably really good. But my children felt very trapped and bored there. Um, my daughter would complain every day of a stomach ache. She didn't want to go. And my son would come home, and instead of being like, this is what I learned today, he came home just exhausted and cranky. And it was, you know, and he's like, mom, I want to read. I want to go like choose what I want to read. And I want to go do the computers and I want to, but I just have to sit there. And then, you know, and so I just, it just became my first grade where he was, I saw that light going out in his eyes. And I was just like, no, no, like, I don't know what we're doing, but we're not doing this. So <clears throat> um, 
he was already reading. He was already, you know, into math, like all the things, you know, he was just like a bright, curious child, like all children are. So um, I took him out of school the second semester of his first grade year and I started homeschooling. And it was a disaster. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean you don't want to do math? Like, we got to do math right now. I had no idea what I was doing. So I... Um, you have to meet my wife because that's uh, <laughs> that was basically her experience too. But she didn't have any other option but to keep on. So Yeah. So... So then um, through a series of serendipitous events, I, I kind of knew exactly what I wanted. And actually, I'll digress a little bit. There was a, did you ever know um, Ron Brenneman? I don't think so. He's, a, he's an American. Um, he was, he's a Mennonite and he grew up in Delaware in a Mennonite community. And Mennonites always go kind of like Mormons and they do like a year of service after high school, I think. Okay. So when he did his year of service, he went and he worked in a um, refugee camp during the war across the border from Morasan in Honduras. And he learned so much there. And he kind of fell in love with like the Salvadoran and Honduran people and fell in love with also a woman. And he ended up moving to Morasan, getting married, having four kids. And he built the Hotel Link Hotel Pirkin Lenka up there. Okay. Um, so... He was just one of these like tinker, maker, builder, founder guys. And he did this amazing thing. And then he created a school called Amunshea. And Amunshea means little seedlings um, in, in Lincoln. And he had this self-directed learning model where he, he said he lived in Morrison for decades and he saw tons of international aid money coming there, but nothing ever moved the numbers. And he said, you'd have to go to these Mened schools, but they're out in a rural community. So you'd be learning all these like, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, whatever. But there was actually no job for you after you graduated yeah. from school. So he said, I'm going to do something totally different. And he, he had a, so he created a problem-based school. He said, the people who are the most able to solve their problems are the people who actually have the problems, not the government, not the UN, but like the people. So he, for, for this is just the story that he told me that really lit me on fire about this. There was a sixth grade class at Amon Shea and he asked them like, what are the problems that you have in your lives? And they said, we don't have potable drinking water. There's 4,500 people in our zone that don't have potable drinking water. So he's like, okay, how are we gonna deal with it? So these, kids, I mean, 11 and 12 years old, they went and they learned all about like, where does the water come from? How do you clean it? How is it delivered to the houses? What's the aquifer? Like who's taking the water? Like all these things. And they followed the chain up and they found out that the problem was an impasse between the municipality and the um, water authority, like Onda or whatever. I don't even know what it's called over there. And so the children negotiated a mediation between them. <laughs> I love that. Right? And now, and now they have potable drinking water. So when he told me that story, I was like, that, that is what I want. But like an urban version, you know, because yeah. my kids don't live in Morrison. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind since 2014. I had this feeling of like, uh, the school isn't right for my kids. It's not right for my family. I want something better. And so I started creating meetups. I love to build community like the expats. And um, and I found, I called meetups and I got parents to come. And one, the first meetup, this guy, Ron Brenneman, happened to be in town and he came and presented his school. And so all of us parents were like, that, that is what we want. So like writing on chart paper and I just started creating like a community of parents who wanted something different. And then one day, like serendipitously, I I, I had heard of Acton Academy from a from a friend, um, and I just you know you write things on a piece of paper like I'm gonna I'm gonna investigate that one day, but I hadn't done it yet, and I always didn't. I never threw away the piece of paper. So then I was in um, Panama at an event, and I was going through the names of the people who were at this event, and I saw Acton Academy Guatemala, and I was like, I'm gonna. I'm going to check. I'm going to talk to this guy. So I went to the dinner and, and I found him and I said, I scooch over to the guy. Who was sitting. I was like, please let me sit here. And I sat next to this guy, Juan my Bonifaci. And I said, I want to talk to you about acting. He's like, absolutely. Within 20 minutes, I was like, that is the school that I'm going to open. And he said, our children learn to be, they learn to do, and they learn to learn. 
And the rest was like details, right? But when he said, learn to do and learn to learn and learn to be, I was like, that's the school for us. And he talked about project-based learning, real world project-based learning. So it was like projects that would actually solve a real problem in the world. One of them that we always do is entrepreneurship that's coming up. Um, our children's business fair in December. Love to invite everybody to that. So, um, so I applied that night and like three weeks later, I received notification that I have been accepted and that was it. I was off and running. Like I had received a call to adventure on a new hero's journey. And then I built this school with my partner, um, Carmen Castro-Dardano, who's a longtime Montessorian. And we started that together and now we're in our eighth year. So is, is there like an, how does that work? Is it like an association with, or are you like a franchise of Acton or how do they, yeah. I don't know what their structure is like. But. That's a great question. It is like a loose affiliation. There are some very specific things that we have to do. We have to do quarterly customer surveys that are reported back to the, the like mothership in Austin, Texas. We have to, um, pay our dues, right? Like there's this, a yeah. little financial component there. Um, and we have to, um, oh, I'm, I'm missing it right now, but yeah, there's some, there's some, we have to have cameras that they can kind of check in and make sure that we're, we are living the philosophy of Acton in the daily, which is basically being extremely respectful to children, believing that they are far more capable than most adults give them credit for. I mean, Alexander Hamilton captained a ship when he was 14. You know, you I don't know how old you are, but when when I was growing up, like we were out doing oh, whatever yeah. we wanted, yeah, yeah. you know, no, I, I was off <laughs> running events for my grandfather's business when I was 16 years old, like handling tens of thousands of dollars, exactly. by ordering stuff like, yeah, it was I look now and I'm like. I can't believe my parents let me do that. Right. But, but, but yeah, we learned then. how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so we we really believe that we follow the needs and the interests of every single child. And we believe that um, every person, not just children, but our staff and our parents is a hero who deserves to find a calling to change the world. And we take that mission very, very seriously. So for some students, maybe that's your regular trajectory to college. You know, my son wants to be an engineer. He's probably going to go to college for that. Um, but then for some, college doesn't make sense, so much sense anymore. The ROI on a, on a college in the United States, I mean, you know, that's a big question now. It's a big risk for families. I mean, think about it. You, you can go as an 18-year-old with a business plan to a bank, and you won't get any money. They will not give you money. But you can go and ask for a student loan, for oh, yeah. $150,000, no. and they'll be more than happy to sign you up. And you have no idea what you're getting on yeah. that. You know, you might get nothing when you get out of college and not be able to find work that you really love or that is going to earn you a successful level of money. So I really think that education is changing. Um, I think it needs to be disrupted. I tried to change it from within. It didn't work. They weren't interested. So well, I was going to say that this model is very countercultural to the Salvadoran approach to education, which is very rote learning. I remember the one of the local kids they said that that in her math class she was writing in a folder from one to a million, like like oh, that was like what horrible. they had to do. I was like that teaches you nothing, nothing. other than busy work. Right. But yeah, lots of those sorts of things even my kids you know went to to escuela americana and it was a great school but yeah and they were trying to make a lot of changes but you could tell especially from the teachers who had been there for a long time they were very much that kind of like rote learning yes. method and so i'm sure for you bringing this in that had to freak people out uh, they, what, what was what was people's responses when you did that yeah that's a great question they kind of either love it or they hate it, or they don't understand it. And they think, um, I think a lot of times people see something new and they, what our experience has been is that people see something new and they, they see it as like a vessel and they say, I'm gonna fill that vessel with all the things that I think that an alternative to traditional education should be. And then they, they assume that's what you're gonna deliver. But then when they really get in there and they see like, we have a really specific thing that we're delivering, but it doesn't match up with what they put in their vessel, 
there's some disappointment there. So that happened for the first couple of years. And, you know, to try to stay, um, to try to stay rentable, I can't think of the American, the American word, the English word now, you need to, um, you need to like viable, what? viable. Yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. To stay commercially viable. Like you need a certain amount of students. Yeah. Right. And so there's a real balance there that you have to strike between, um, let, you have to filter hard to only let in people who really get what you're doing, but you can't filter so hard that you're going to go out of business, yeah. you know? So that's a, that's a challenge for all acting owners around the world um, and probably most alternative schools. Um, so, so yeah, so now we do a lot of upfront educating for parents. The, the application process is very long and intense because we want to make sure that when people come, they're coming for us. We don't want them on a rebound from an old school that they were at that they didn't like, and then they're running to us because they're running away. We want them to say, this is the model of this, this, like yeah. I was, this is the model of school that I want for my kids and that they're really intentionally choosing it. And what what percentage of the students are, are expats versus Salvadoran? Most are Salvadoran. Okay, really? Yes, yes. Um, in the beginning, we had more kind of mixed families like myself, like one foreigner and one Salvadoran. We do still have a significant population of those kind of families. Um, and then we do have some from the embassy, which is wonderful, um, although they don't stay forever, yeah. which is sad. But um, but they're a wonderful addition, especially with that native English in the, in the classrooms is excellent. Um and then, but most are Salvadoran families. And do you guys fall like legally under Minet or is it kind of like it's its own thing? They're doing it over here and they don't bother you or how does that? I know they're real rigid in how they like look at everything. They are. Um, we, we went to them in the beginning and they were they were like open, but they, they do have some extremely rigid things. It just... It, it's really in the in the more superficial details. Like we have mixed age classrooms. So our kids are, you know, we have one to three years older together, three to six are together, six to nine. It's like that in three year increments. And that's a wonderful way of learning because the younger ones are looking up to the older ones and the older ones are serving as leaders and models. Um, so it's just, it's a great way of doing things. Maria Montessori did that. She is one of our heroes. We have a Montessori, authentic Montessori preschool. Um, Act in all of the world does that, but MENAD will not allow you to have more than one age group in a room. So that's really difficult, yeah. you know? Um, so that's something that we can't, I don't know how we're gonna, gonna get MENAD if, if that's the kind of limitation they have, because we're not willing to change that because we really, really are committed to yeah. that. We really believe in it. So, um, Mened has come a couple of times. Mened came during the pandemic and tried to shut us down. And I said, for for COVID reasons or because we weren't supposed to be in school, and we weren't. So school. you guys stayed in operation during. We we didn't. We. That's awesome, by the way. I was so thank you. pissed that they. <laughs> I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. They the one time I had to take my daughter to to the hospital in the middle of the night. And I drive by and the strip club's like full and the schools are like still shut down. I was so angry. It's crazy. I was like, gosh. So anyways, yes. don't, don't get me started on that. I but, know. So you guys kept kept we, in class. We, you know, it was at the time we were like, we don't know how, yeah. how bad yeah, is yeah. this. So we, we stayed out. Um, we did, we, we switched to online learning immediately for the children that could do that. I mean, not the little, little yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then in October of 2020, we started going to the park and playing chess and, and playing and being together. And then in January of 2021, we were back in school. We moved our classrooms outside. We took measures. We did math. Yeah. We did all that, you know, but we were like, no, these kids need to no, be in school. they need to be in school. They need to be in school. Yeah. Like we were, and I felt so happy that we didn't have Maynard because we were the only school that was in yeah. at that time. And I felt really, really good about it. Um, and I still do. And I'm, you know, this week the government shut schools down again. And we were off this week, so we didn't have to make that decision. But we don't close when it rains and they and they close. I mean, I probably shouldn't be saying this out loud, but that's the truth. Yeah. And um, so it's it's a balance. But then again, if you don't have me in, you have to pay taxes. So 
that's a hard thing also, yeah. you know? Yeah. So you got to pick and choose, but we're really um, committed to our model. We don't want to change it. We hope MENED will, well, they have come and watched and observed just to learn from us. Um, but I, you know, we'll see. We'll yeah. see what happens. To be, no, I know. To be so determined. my kids, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Escuela Libre here in El yes, Sante. Yes, yes. Um, so that's, my kids went to that till nice. till eighth grade and we always called it the hippie school. That was, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was amazing. They came yeah. over, they had cooking classes and they're like, come home covered in soot. They're like, yeah, we were roasting coffee today. Nice. And they were, yeah, they'd have... Paolo was great with like all the plays and the uh, different things. Yes. And so, so my wife would do, we kind of did a hybrid. So my wife would do English and math and science with them mm -hmm. a couple days a week. And then they'd go to Escuela Libre a couple days a week to get all the, the other activities. And it, um, cause we, we, we did the one issue that we saw with some people is if we didn't have transcripts for them later in life, it would, cause some right. issues. So we wanted to make sure that we were going through a homeschool program where we could give them transcripts. So right. that was, so are you guys able to give transcripts if they, if we they go are, on? So we're accredited in the United States, Okay, but that somehow doesn't really make it easier for Salvadorans. Um, so like if they're to go on to one of the international schools, I'm sure that helps that they have yeah, I mean, like my son, for example, he has chosen to leave Acton and go to the the British school as a freshman this year. Um, and again, we're follow the child's needs and interests. That's what he needed to do, and that's wonderful. And he's really enjoying it. Um, and they, you know, they accepted him. He went. He, did, you know, he did the evaluation. You have to do a lot of things in the admissions process, and and he went. So I don't. I, and I've never seen a child who's left our school or moved to another country not get into a school. Um, and I just, to me, I'm like, if you have the skills and the abilities and you can write well, and you can speak well, and you can do math and you know what you want to do, who can stop you from doing that is my philosophy. And so, um, our goal at Acton is not necessarily that kids go to, go to college. It's like if they want to, and they know exactly why they're going and what they're going to get out of that then they should definitely go. But if they have a path that is more um, entrepreneurial or that is innovative, that there isn't even, I mean, you know, the jobs today, you were never going to school for these yeah. jobs that you have today, right? Like what, do you, what you're doing here, there was no school for that. So um, opening a brewery, there's no school for that. Opening your own school, there's no school for that. So I feel, so at Acton, we have a, a thing in high school called the next great adventure. And that's where students really reflect on what are my passions? What are my interests? What can I get paid for? What am I really good at? What are the injustices and opportunities in the world? And so then they create um, a board of directors in their lives, which are people who are doing already something similar to what they're doing or can help them. Um, they also look at um, what resources they will need and they write us almost like a TED Talk speech that they pitch to employers or to further education or to internships or whatever that will take them to the next step in what they're doing. And to me, that is just far more powerful to be able to do that than to just have an excellent SAT score. Yeah. You know, so um, it's really real world learning. Conventional education is preparing you to continue with your conventional education. And Acton is prepar preparing you to go out into the world and to be on a hero's journey to change the world. And I think one of the things you were saying, you guys do like a business fair. We do. They, so they create their own businesses and then- Yes, every single, I'm so glad you asked. Every single year, one of the quests that we do is called the entrepreneurship quest. And every child from six years old through high school creates their own business. It could be a product, it could be a service. Um, and what, then, what's the, the craziest business that they've come up with that you were just like, oh one, gosh, one like. group last year did a car wash, which was so, so fun. And they were, I think the first one who did a service and they were like seven years old, you know, it was so great. Um, last year, the, the kids who won the highest business potential created their own bath bombs and marketed them super well. They won $50. They won a $50 prize from the judges. And um, then at Mother's Day, 
they took their $50 and they bought a whole bunch more stuff. And then they were like selling it to everyone to give to their moms, you know? So they're really, they really get into the spirit. They learn how to put a price. They have to write a sales pitch. They create prototypes. They test them in the market. Um, This year, our students who are um, nine and older will do an online business as part of it and on a platform so they can continue selling if they want to throughout the year. So that'll be Saturday, December 9th at Acton Academy. I'll, you know, I'll be putting it on expats and everything. So people can come if they yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, okay. the public can come. Okay. Last year, everyone was sold out by noon. It was just, it's awesome. just an incredible experience. So, wow. and, and we just think, you know, entrepreneurship is the engine of every country. And so if these children already know what I didn't learn until I was 40 years old about how to set a price on something, how to market it, how to get, you know, put it on social media and all that. If they're learning that already at seven years old, if they're on No, and I think it's so needed here. One thing I've noticed about Salvadorans are extremely hardworking. Yes. But there's not a lot of like risk taking and, right. and kind of thinking outside of the box. You, you know, usually if somebody working well, like five people will copy them rather mm-hmm. than doing something different. So I think having at this young age, them learning this, like thinking differently, taking yeah. those risks, I think that's what it's going to need to take. The, the economy here to the next level. We agree. Uh, so it's so I love that you guys are are doing that there. Thank you. Yeah, we love it. It's and it's so fun. So you have uh, one school, but twelve uh, you know brewery locations. Right. So uh, when's, yeah. when when's the next uh, when's the next school opening up? Oh, okay. Well, you know, I think with all these wonderful. Um, risk takers who are moving here to El Salvador and are excited about helping El Salvador grow, that um, one of the things that's hard for families is that there isn't a great school down here near Bitcoin Beach and Sante or, you know, however you want to call it. And uh, so- Don't don't call it Bitcoin Beach because your (laughs) your expat friends will (laughs) will chew you out. Right. (laughs) Bitcoin Beach. So, so Andy over here uh, and I've been t- been scouting and trying to find properties. Um, it's been really hard. I mean, I've been looking for a couple of years now, and we haven't found a great space to start. But we're looking. So, if anyone watching this um, has a great place for a great price, we'd love to start a school. Um, we are looking at some land right now. Um, you know, but th- that's a lot to like build something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a lot easier to just rent something and like kind of do a prototype and see how it goes and then iterate. Um, so yeah, we would love to create an Acton Academy down here for families that are moving to El Salvador, for sure. So what's what's the what's the goal timeline for people out there that are listening that yeah. are like making plans to move to El Salvador? Do oh you my think goodness! This is, uh, I don't want to commit. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, yeah. The soonest would be the soonest. Absolute soonest would be, yeah, next yeah. the next school year. I mean, if we found a place, we could do it, right? I mean, I started my school and I started planning it in January and it opened in July. So um, it can be done. But the most important thing is is the space. I mean, it's, to start, the yeah. family's in the space. But you right? see a demand on the coastal area that I there's lots so. of people. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that was... For us, my kids had to get up at 4.30 in the morning so they could leave by 5.30. Yeah, oh, not Because you know how it is. It's like if you leave 15 minutes later, it could take you 45 minutes more to get to the school. So they'd actually have to get there and then sit there for an hour. But it's like if we left any later, they didn't make it on time. So so I think, you know, for there to be a, a school on the coast, and especially now as as more and more expats are, are moving down here. And we see a lot of Salvadorans now from the city moving to the beach. It used to be unheard of. Like when we tell people that we lived at the beach, they would look at us like we were crazy because right. we were an hour away from the city. Now a lot of those same people want to live at the beach. So right. I, I think that you would definitely find a, you know, a lot of people interested in that. Well, Mike, tell me, because you you know so much more. I've been up in my little world up there now running that school. Um, so I haven't been out meeting people as much. What 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 do you think? Like is how many people are coming? Do you see families? Do people what like what's the word on the street about that? There's there's a ton of families coming in, a mm-hmm. lot of them with a lot of kids. Um 
it seems like a lot of them are winding up in San Blas. It's it's cheaper there, mm -hmm. I think, than mm -hmm. than El Zante's gotten kind of expensive. So you see, but I think any anywhere on the coast between San Blas and El Zante, I think that you know be a short drive for for everyone. So right. I think that they're. I think you would have a deluge of people, but you never know till you put it out there and, yeah. you know, people have to, to start writing checks and put their money where their mouth is. So, yeah, definitely. Um, but I, I mean, I can't see it not working, but yeah. Same. I do. I do feel that uh, for sure. And I also feel like Acton Academy with our focus on freedom. Um, I didn't mention that a lot of what we do is Socratic dialogue. So I know you had Deanna and Joel on. Um, talking about learning how to think, learning how to critically think, being able to tolerate someone else's ideas um, without becoming angry or shutting down or being triggered or whatever it is. Um, that's a lot of what we do at Acton also. Um, our students also have a lot of freedom of choice about what they do work on at any given time. We're also mastery based. So we don't mind, we're self-directed, self-paced and mastery based. So we don't mind if it takes you three months to master third grade math or two years to master third grade math. The important thing is that you master third grade yeah. math so that your foundation is really strong, you know? Um, so I just feel like there's so many things. I don't know very much about Bitcoin, but I think like the underlying philosophy is kind of libertarian. Can I say that? Yeah, no, definitely. And Acton also, I think our underlying philosophy is definitely very libertarian. So um, so I would also think that families that are moving here because of the Bitcoin um, concentration would be aligned with us. Like I was talking about the filter, making sure families yeah. want us, not just like, oh, there's a school nearby, but like, oh, there's an Acton Academy nearby. Heck yeah, we're moving to El Salvador. You know, that's the kind of energy that we want. So are you guys uh, letting people pay in Bitcoin yet at uh, Acton? You know, that's so funny. No one has asked us yet. Mm. And I don't even know how to set that up. <laughs> well, it's very easy. We can help you with that. <laughs> I know you, got, I know you guys have done that. it for the, for the, I mean, I saw the one uh, Bitcoin conference. People could like do an automatic pay with Bitcoin for their beer. For, uh -huh, yeah, for yeah, Cadejo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They set that up, I think, two years ago. So they just started accepting Bitcoin at the international school where, where my kids are nice. at because they had a bunch of Bitcoin families come in and we're harassing them to, to uh, let them pay in Bitcoin. Right. So we're open to like, it. All right, all right. We're open so, to it. I just, would, okay. I just we'll have to help get help you set up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so. gotten, there's a lot of great platforms now that make it, make it really easy. Very cool. Um, so what's, What's next? I mean, you've covered beer, you've covered education. What's <laughs> what's the next venture for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think I'm in a period of like having climbed the mountain and I feel really stable and good. I feel like our acting is just doing great. We have an incredible team. It's just gelling. It feels really good every day. And still problems happen, but it's like everything feels very, very stable. We have amazing families. It's just a beautiful place. Um, and then I needed to kind of rest. Yeah. And so I'm kind of just now coming out of feeling pretty burned out. Um, so I did, I went back to St. Louis this summer and just stayed at my mom's house and didn't do much. And I just feel like it was a lot of like, you know, you need that downtime. You need go. the winter yeah. before you start coming, you know, growing in spring again. So I don't know what is next, but I do love the question. How do you feel about the business environment? You know, growing up in the U.S., coming from New York, and then opening a business here, and seeing things change quite a bit over the last decade. How do you explain the business environment to people here? Do you think it's a positive environment, a hard environment? What would you say? You know, I think actually, um, I think it's a great environment for starting businesses. I think it's a much better bet here to start a business than to have a job. Yeah. Um, and I think that the the government is, um, at least in my experience, and, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this out loud, but that they do, you can just kind of like start something and no one, is, you know, it's not like, oh, you got to go. It's permanent. Yeah. You, you do eventually. But like right in the beginning, you can kind of just start up your own thing and nobody's breathing down your neck or trying to control you. Um, They'll kind of let you know when, like, hey, you, exactly. yeah. you've gotten big enough that now you need, which in the U.S., it's like if you try to do something without the right thing, they could like 
all of a sudden shut you down and you yes. know knock down your building or whatever. Here I feel like they work with you more. They do. Not that they they want you to do it the right way, but it's like they understand it's a process. Yes, so. and it's still a human relationship. Yeah. It's not just like a black box. It's like they might come and say, oh, you need to fix it. Okay, what about this? Okay, I'll come back in a couple of days. You know, it's like it's still very, very human. So um, I think I, th I encourage everybody to start a business. I think it's a fantastic adventure. I think this is a great place to do it. Um, I think El Salvador needs innovation. I think there's so much room here for doing a festival yeah. or creating a science center or another thing that, can, you know, what do people do here on the weekends? It's a lot of like going to the lake, going to the beach, drinking, eating. Yeah. But like if we had more fun, educational, constructive things for children to do, I think that would sell. You know, I think having festivals where people can gather, um, you know, we, we went. I, I saw the Pride Fest a couple of years ago. I think it was pre-pandemic. And I was like, this is the first time I've ever been out in public with a bunch of other Salvadorans and felt that vibe of like everybody being together doing the same thing. I know it's a super subculture and all that uh, in El Salvador, um, but we just happened upon it. And I was like, this is the first time I felt that like parade festival feeling here and i'd been here for 10 yeah. years so i would love to see more of that well and that's definitely springing up you see people out and about at night and doing mm -hmm. things but there you said there's not a lot of options and right. coming from the us is a very hyper competitive market for everything i think actually to open up a business here you just have a lot less competition the a lot more flexibility how you do things and there's all kinds of market openings. I've seen as people are, you know, coming in, they're wanting to build, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of options. There's not people that understand, you know, the taste of North Americans or Europeans. Right. And right. so people that bring all those things to the table, I think there's a ton of potential. So that's why I always tell people like, if you have any skill, bring it here and you'll find a, a place to start a business. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, yeah, I think it's, and, and I, you know, don't, don't open a restaurant and I don't say that cause you're going to be competing <laughs> with Cadejo. You will be, but everybody opens a restaurant, yeah. do something different, different because people are looking for new things to do. So that, that would be my encouragement. Um, I love entrepreneurs. I love the entrepreneurial process. I think it's the greatest adventure that you can, you can go on. It, it's a great adventure. You know, some people climb mountains, some people build businesses, yeah. Um, but I, so people, if you're moving here, like definitely come and build something new that people are going to love. So, so what's gonna, what is it going to take to get you from like lurking on the edges of the Bitcoin crowd and get you in? I mean, I've seen you at the conference, the Bitcoin conference. I've seen you, you have, you know, so, so what, what yeah. is it that, uh, yeah. Are you, are you going to go this fear. year to the conference? Yes, I'm okay. going. All right. Noor set me up. Um, so I'm going, Angie's going, who was also on the, uh -huh. on your podcast, um, so we're excited about that. I think for me, like the philosophy of Bitcoin is so right on. I absolutely agree with all of it, but I feel it's, I feel it's risky. You know, for me, I feel like it's risky. Like You're a risk taker. I, You're I am, an entrepreneur. But, <laughs> Come on now. But I don't fully understand it. Yeah. And I'm worried about, I'm worried about quantum computing, being able to crack it. I'm worried about scarcity. I'm worried about the governments. Um, so for me, it just feels too volatile, you know, I don't have a lot of extra cash hanging around and I don't wanna like, I don't know, I'm scared of it. That's the honest truth, I'm scared of it. Have you, have you read the Bitcoin standard yet? No, you need, is that a book? You need, yeah, it's a book. You need I to read it to. And, okay. it's, and it's not like, super technical, anything like that. It's just basically the history of money yeah. and taking it back to, you know, like thousands of years and how money's progressed over time. I, th I think you'd find it very, nice. very interesting. But even as like a business owner, I I'm assuming like on credit card payments that you guys accept, you pay four or five, six percent to the bank for the fees to do that. Mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. And the restaurant business, I know what the margins are in the restaurant business. They're, they are, you know, 20% of your lucky, 10% for most people. So when you're taking that yeah. chunk, so, you know, that money could be in your pocket instead of you guys are taking Bitcoin. So there's lots of different, you know, advantages to it. So, you know, there's been more competition in that space as well. 
um, with Nico coming online, and uh-huh. I think that has forced the banks to lower percentages. Um, which have, have you seen them coming down, the percentages? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, I remember people tell me they're paying like seven, eight percent, and I was like, "How in the world right. can you afford that?" Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's tough. Businesses are made at the margins. Yeah. Um. So. So yeah, well, definitely. I w- I would love to read it. Um, All right. We we got to get you a copy of yeah, that book. Yeah, I can I can download it. But that's great. Yeah, we have a book too about acting called The Courage to Grow. Okay. How Acton Academy turns learning upside down. I'd love to share that with you. Awesome. I should have brought a copy to show the audience. Um, and I know I we had I know we had did were you were you scrolling through and playing those videos and Andy did we have things that I was supposed to be asking about. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this is this is at dad. the school? So this is a, a dad from Acton. Okay. And, and, and this is that this is one of your classrooms there. No, this is his office. Okay, actually. okay. Soy papá Acton, orgullosamente. We may need to get a we may need to, to give a translation. Y está en el estudio de Impact Community. Que cuando con mi esposa empezamos a buscar opciones para identificar a dónde podía ingresar nuestra hija. Yeah, he says when they were looking for options. Ella pudiera desarrollarse. They're entrepreneurs. Oh, it lost Uh-oh. the sound. He's in a place where they, where we help develop soft skills, resilience, perseverance, creativity, he said, uh, as entrepreneurs, they notice all these skills that they needed and that our school foments in their kids. And so they wanted their kids to also learn those skills. Yeah. Do you, uh, when your kids are like grown and out, have you thought like, is this still something that's gonna be, you're driven to do or is it, I mean, I know a lot of times people want to be involved in education yeah, when their kids are yeah, at that yeah, age, yeah. but. That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure at some point I would transition out of acting. Um, you know, as, as our kids get older and they may go to the States or something, then maybe it would be like, I would also go to the States or live between the two, you know, and, and kind of just be able to be more of a, of a world, what do you call that? Like citizen yeah. of the world. Um, how, but I'm not, how, I'm not really sure. Kids? My kids are 12 and 14. Okay. So I got a little bit so, yeah, of time, yeah. you know, it'd probably be like six more years. Before it, sne- it sneaks up on you. Cause I know. My, my wife and I, <laughs> like our oldest just went off and our son is a junior and we're like, we're gonna be empty nesters I know. You're here. Like, what are we gonna do now? I'm like, right. I'm already feeling it now. I, just I don't. I don't feel. I don't feel like I'm that old, but I'm right. one of those old people now. It's gonna. But it's. It also. You're like, wow. We can just take off and right. go do things. Right. And what so are we gonna do now? We're kind of looking forward to it now. Uh, yeah. Not that we don't love our kids. If kids, if you're listening, we right, love you. Right. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, you're kind of like, wow. This is a new stage of life. That yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So probably like six years will be a really great time to think about that. Yeah. And then what about with uh, the the brewery? Do you guys want to keep expanding throughout Central America? And- yeah, I think we do. We want to keep expanding um, the the business and keep uh-huh, keep growing, keep moving throughout El Salvador, possibly do the distribution to the United States would be amazing. It's just such a bigger market yeah. there. You know, that that's the thing here. We're talking about entrepreneurs, though. The challenge here is that the market is so small. Yeah. It's just so small. So if you're not doing something mass, it can be daunting. You know, our beer is more expensive than Constancia's beer, you know, and a lot of pre- people here are very price conscious. They need to be, you know, um, because salaries yeah. aren't very high. Yeah. Right. So. So that is that is a difficult thing. If you have kind of a premium product, it's a really, really diminishingly small market of people who can buy your product. It, it is in one sense, but on the other hand, I am surprised that like the number, you know, the amount of money spent on different things here that you're like, like what? just like construction supplies. I mean, you go to, you know, we were just buying windows for the the place we're doing here and seeing, you know, there's the number of places now where you can get good quality windows. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're seeing, I think the market kind of mature and, nice. and develop. And so, 
it does seem that there's, I mean, you just look at the number of cars on the road and I'm just like. Right. Wow. <laughs> now we need a better public transportation yeah. system. Get yeah, those that's buses all, that's, cleaned up. Yeah, that's always tough once the once the city's developed then after the fact trying to get it done but yeah it's it's the traffic just keeps getting worse that's terrible for sure. terrible it's starting to be like guatemala but if yeah. we had really clean safe cheap public transportation i would take it definitely so yeah. that that would be great and then get rid of the all the billboards It'd be such a more beautiful place you there know. is a lot of signage here a lot of signage. It is, yeah so yeah. that would help bring even more people to live here yeah. i think if you really, if they really allowed that natural beauty to be seen, but I know, I know they earn money on those. Yeah, those yeah, and it's it's step by step yeah. that you see things kind of improving. So, what would you is what have, that we haven't talked about? Would you want to leave people with like for? Ooh. There's a lot of people that that watch the show or listen that their kind of dream is to move to El Salvador. Mm -hmm. or they're you know they at least want to come visit. So. What are things that people should be thinking about if they're thinking about moving here other than looking into acting for their kids? Yeah, yeah Which is yeah. a huge thing because that's the first question people ask that have kids is like, what about the schools? Right, right. Um, but what other things do you think that they need to be thinking of as far as moving down here? It's a good question. What, what was a challenging thing for you just like culturally or that you missed about the U.S. or or Maybe there wasn't any. I don't know. The language acquisition was a challenge uh, for sure. You've got to be willing to learn Spanish, and you've got to be you, you've got to be willing to learn it, and you've and you've got to like learning it. Yeah. You know, um, the people here are so warm. I, I had lived in Europe, which was a very different experience. They did not like Americans, whereas here I felt as an American very much like wanted and invited and people were really warm and they really liked that I was American. I didn't have to pretend I was Canadian. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, so I think that's a great thing about El Salvador. Also, um, what was hard? It's hard not being able to walk around. That is hard. So you have to know that, that there's very few places. I guess down here in El Salvador, you, you can, can walk yeah, around. On, on the, the beach, beach you, you can, can walk around. But yeah, in the city, it's not very walkable. Right, right. But, you know, expats is a great place. If you're going to come, ask a lot of questions there, connect with people, come down and, you know, build your community, figure out what something that you love that you want to offer to El Salvador and make it. Um, I find a lot. I, do you this is a question for you. Do you find that people come here and they are working remotely for jobs with good income? from other countries and then they like come down here and they don't learn the language and they kind of don't mix? Is that a thing or not? I don't find that that much, especially okay. on the coast. I think because like in El Zante, it's such a small community mm -hmm. and it, it's pretty integrated. You don't really have like just expat ghettos. I mean, it's, it's right, really right. a lot of integration. So I'm sure it's like that in some places, mm -hmm. but I feel like in El Zante, I haven't really sensed that. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like that in the city? No, I really don't. A little bit at the embassy. Yeah. I think people are a little insular there. Um, you know, they kind of have their own little, they well, their they, own world. And it used to be that they couldn't go certain places because my wife is friends with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, we're going to go here. They're like, oh, we're not allowed to go there. Right. She's like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, no, that's the red zone that we're not. Ah, so, yeah. uh, but I think somebody was from the embassy was telling me now they don't really have any red zones that's anymore. Great. They can go everywhere. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, and embassy people do, I find they do really speak good Spanish. So, cause they, tr they have training yeah, right before yeah. they come. So that's awesome. So yeah, I just, I think, you know, you gotta be a risk taker. You have to be resilient. You have to be willing to come down here and climb a really steep learning curve, but it's worth it. You know, I mean, look at this view on your drive down here and, um, it's a warm and, and friendly and lovely place. It's manageable because of its size. It's close to the U S like, I think it's, I think it's a great little yeah little corner of the world no it's it's very convenient for people that need to work on the u.s schedule you don't have a time yeah. difference and if, you know to, to fly up for a meeting it's just as quick to get to dc from here as it is from california or to get to california as it would be from dc and so it's yeah. it's a pretty easy place for people to, that have to like you know check back in a few times a year so i think it has a lot of a lot of things going for it Definitely. So yeah, I'd say think big. Don't let anything stop you. Come down, try it, fail, try again, and you know, something's gonna stick. 
So the I want to make sure people know where they can follow you and, and get plugged into these things. So we'll we'll start one at a time. First, the expat page. Do do they have to? I'm trying to remember for the the Facebook ex, expat page. Do they have to request to yes. join to participate? And yeah, so there's a couple now. Two other people have taken our name, expats in El Salvador. I don't know why. But so now I've changed it to the original expats in El Salvador. You'll know because we're close to 9,000 people. I'm the, I'm the founder, Shannon Falkenstein. My name is on there. Um, you need to be not from El Salvador, um, but living here or really seriously considering living here. That's who we want on that page. Um, so there's some questions to vet you. Um, please answer them. You'd be surprised how many people don't and they don't get in. Um, and keep it, I say like good vibes only in the expats in El Salvador group. So that's one place to find um, connection, access, um, belonging, ideas. That's a great place for that. Everyone on the whole is like really wants to help other people do well in El Salvador. Little snarkiness, a lot of free speech <laughs> that we tolerate there, but you know, you got to be tough to live here. Then um, for Cadejo Brewing Company, let me show you that again. So we are like the largest craft brewery now in Central America. Started here in 2013. Um, so you can get a huge variety of beers and at, at any of our restaurants. Um, are the restaurants lunch, dinner? Do you guys lunch do breakfast and dinner. there? Or? We do breakfast at Montaña and at some of the other ones. I'm not sure if all okay. of them. I think down here at the beach too. Um, you know, it's interesting a lot. I do, I do find culturally like Salvadorans won't go to a beer place for lunch because they feel like it's like, oh no, beer is for party time. Yeah. But you don't have to drink beer. We also have artisanal sodas, um, you know, mineral water, all the things. So, uh, and we just have great, we have great food and great service and it's really friendly. So, um, so you can definitely come there for lunch or breakfast and then Acton Academy El Salvador is our little school. And what's the best way? Do you guys have a website? Or, yes, a website. Or? And if you go, and if you want to show the, the website, so right there, if you click speak with our director, you're going to go into a form and within minutes, you'll be able to set up a Zoom call with me. And I'll be able to talk to you about your family, your kids, our school, what we do, what we don't do. And, uh, and you can just learn everything you need to know there. Okay. okay. Are you on Twitter at all? That's the Bitcoin people. They don't really do Facebook much or the other things. They're all on Twitter. We right? are on Twitter okay. or X. We um I yeah, don't we X, don't post I, much I, on I still call it Twitter. <laughs> on Twitter X. We don't we don't post much there. Um we found it just wasn't, you know, just didn't get a lot of traction. Yeah. We're more Instagram and and still Facebook. So um, but yeah, we do have a profile there that you could reach us through. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Did we miss anything? I don't think so. All right. <laughs> so people got their beer needs taken care of, their education <laughs> needs taken care of, and their uh, community by joining the the expat uh, Facebook group. And yeah, I was I was I was telling Shannon I've I've had a number of people uh, come after me on there. I don't I don't know why <laughs> I seem to attract that. So luckily I have thick skin. So yes, yeah, you gotta have uh, thick it's, skin. It's, uh, I always get a kick out of it. So. Well, thank you so much for, I know it's a haul to, to, to come down here. So I appreciate you come down. Appreciate the, the beer that you brought for us. Sure thing. And uh, we'll have to, once you get the Coastal Acton Academy opened up, we'll have to have you back on to promote it. Nice. So I know I like Andy's that. been like, <laughs> he's very excited. He, he keeps like, he's, he's got the young kids. So he's like, I know. we need something down He's here, where so. I was when yeah. I started. So. I'm kind of on the other end where I'm like, ah, oh, well, You're it's like, too I'm late done, for me. Right? So, you know, you guys figure it out. <laughs> but Well, I'm sure you raise your kids with all those same good entrepreneurial yeah. and independent values. So well, definitely. Yeah. So, so we're going to see you at the conference yes. right, next week. We will be there with Angela. Okay. And I'm going to ask you if you've, if you've gotten the Bitcoin standard yet. If okay, you started the Bitcoin on standard. the Bitcoin right. standard. I'm going to so, order it yeah. from my, so. on my Kindle. So I'm not sure when this one's going to come out, but it might come out before the conference. So it is. Make sure you say I hi to, so. to Shannon uh, <laughs> at the thing and, and ask her when her school is going to be ready. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike and your team. Appreciate it.